Dr. Rudolf Tanzi is a neuroscientist and professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. He is also the director of the Genetics and Aging Research Unit at Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Tanzi co-discovered the first three Alzheimer's disease genes, including APP, and directs the Cure Alzheimer's Fund Alzheimer's Genome Project, which identified the first neuroinflammation-related Alzheimer's gene, CD33. Dr. Tanzi has published over 600 papers, is a New York Times best-selling author, and was one of Time 100's most influential people in the world. In addition to his work in AD and brain health, Dr. Tanzi is also a musician. He professionally plays keyboards, most recently with Joe Perry and Aerosmith. And with that, let me start the interview. Professor Tanzi, you are a neuroscientist, professor of neurology at Harvard University. You're also the director of the genetic and aging research unit at Massachusetts General Hospital. So you discovered all three familial early onset Alzheimer's disease genes, and you have published over 500 scientific papers, including the top three most cited papers in the field of Alzheimer's disease research. So welcome to Modern Health Span, and thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me here. So, Professor Tanzi, can you tell me a bit about why you chose to study neuroscience in general, and I guess Alzheimer's in particular? You know, I fell into Alzheimer's, really, um, way, way back when I was a kid. And I mean, a kid, like 20 years old, and I was working with Jim Gasella, who was a few years older than me. We were the first ones to find genetic markers in the human genome and use those to find the disease gene which is mundane now, but no one had ever done it before. We found the, the Huntington's, disease, Huntington's disease gene, movement disorder, no one knew the cause. And the idea was if you can find the gene for it, maybe you can figure out what causes it. But to find the gene, we had to find what we now call SNPs and, and genomic variants, the type of things that you know 23andMe test for. Well, we found the first five ever in the genome, the first five pieces of hay pulled out of the haystack, mm-hmm. trying to find a Huntington's gene. And we were so lucky that of those five random pieces of hay, uh, the haystack, two were pins or two were needles in the haystack. We found the Huntington's gene in miraculous time. The odds were about 150,000 to one against what we did, but it launched the modern era of the human genome um, uh, project and the human genome project became inevitable uh, after the, these types of studies. I turned my attention after that around 1982 to trying to find Alzheimer's genes only because I was, trying to map the first end-to-end chromosome. I was trying to build the first end-to-end map of a chromosome. I was a student, so I picked chromosome 21 because it's the smallest. And you're a student, you want to get done. And um, and chromosome 21 is is in uh, duplicate, is three copies rather than two in Down syndrome. And when I read that Down syndrome subjects by middle age inevitably get Alzheimer's pathology, I speculated there might be an Alzheimer's gene and maybe it's on chromosome 21, and I had the map. So I, I looked for an Alzheimer's gene based on that and um, speculated that it would be the gene that makes the amyloid plaque. So my superiors there at Harvard told me way too much speculation, shameless speculation for a student. Luckily, I was young and stubborn, and uh, it all turned out right. The amyloid gene was on chromosome 21. It explained why Down syndrome patients get Alzheimer's pathology, and it turned out to be the first Alzheimer's gene. That was the first familial early onset Alzheimer's gene and first Alzheimer's gene in general. Then I never looked back. I stayed with Alzheimer's. And the, and the weird thing is, is that after I started studying Alzheimer's, my grandmother developed Alzheimer's. And so then I was able to experience firsthand how this disease just robs you of who you are. And that created even more passion for getting this job done to end this disease. Right. So that first gene you found, that was CD33. Is that Oh, no, no, CD33 was uh, much later. That was much 2000. Later. Oh, okay. yeah. This was back in summer of 1986. Right. And it was wow. the gene that makes the, uh, I named it APP, oh, the yeah. amyloid precursor protein. Um, it's the precursor that makes the amyloid that first deposits in the brain as the first step in Alzheimer's disease. That, that happens decades before symptoms. And, um, and then the next genes were called the presenilins. And they were also early onset genes. We found those in 95 
when I say we, it's not just me. I'm always working with a team. There's other, you know, I always say co-discovered, not discovered. And uh, the presenilins were involved with how the APP got chopped up to make the amyloid. So those first three genes said it's either the precursor of the amyloid or the things that chop up the precursor to make the amyloid. So everything said amyloid with those, those first three early onset genes in the 80s and 90s. Right. So that's really, and this is like before bioinformatics and there was like no, <laughs> there were very limited computing. There was support. nothing. I mean, nothing. We used to, I, I would calculate, I would do the statistical analysis by hand with a calculator on the bus commuting to work. I mean, I remember the first time I went down to a Cray supercomputer, it was in uh, University of Indiana, where the computer was going to spit out my statistics, you know, my, for, for the linkage and association to the disease. And I remember sitting there with the other investigators and it took so long, uh, we just played endless games of Scrabble waiting for this computer to spit out a number. You know, I say, man, I could do this faster by hand. But, you know, that was, these were the old days before the Human Genome Project. I mean, everything, literally to do stuff in the lab, you couldn't even buy stuff. You had to go to like the department store or we would go to Walmart and walk through the aisles and say, yeah, we could use that to transfer the DNA. We could use that as a tub. That lasagna pan looks like we could use it. And we built that, we jerry-rigged everything back then in the 80s. It was a pretty fun time. Actually, I wrote a book. My first book was Decoding Darkness. And I'm not trying to uh, promote my book, but the whole first chapter was about those crazy kind of old, you know, pioneering days of having to buy stuff at Walmart in order to, do, in order to study DNA for the first time in the early 80s and how we found the early Huntington's disease and Alzheimer's genes that way. Right. Amazing. Yeah. And, and you I, I saw that you're still working on that. I mean, in April this year, you published a paper with another 13 genes. Yeah, that, I, yeah. I'm still, you know, we went from, you know, a handful of variants in the genome to then, you know, studying a thousand at a time. That was the, it still is the age of what's called GWAS, Genome Wide Association Studies. And that's how we found the gene you mentioned, CD33. Mm -hmm. In 08, we did the scan of the whole genome. We found CD33. Uh, we had no idea what it was. Um, Time Magazine called it a top 10 medical breakthrough of the year. We kind of laughed because we said, we don't even know what this gene does. Well, it turned out that that gene turns on the neuroinflammation. And the neuroinflammation in the brain is triggered by the plaques and tangles. And it kills 10 to 100 times more nerve cells than the plaques and tangles. And that was the first neuroinflammation Alzheimer's gene. CD33 was the on switch that causes the neuroinflammation. And so most of the genes that have come out of the more modern studies, we now have over 100 Alzheimer's genes, by the way, over 100. The first ones way back in the 80s and 90s said amyloid, amyloid, amyloid. And then the more, the more recent ones are saying neuroinflammation. And what, what, what's interesting is those amyloid genes cause the disease early in life, under 60, under 50, in some cases in your 20s. And they all increase amyloid. Whereas the genes for the late onset Alzheimer's, the more common form that we're getting from the big genome screens, mostly have to do with neuroinflammation. And if you look across diseases and genetics, there's a trend that holds up a pattern that the genes that cause the earliest form of the disease, whatever those mutations do, tell you the earliest steps in the disease, the things that happen first. And the late onset genes tell you what happens later. So the, what we learned is that the amyloid plaque comes two to three decades before the disease, kind of like cholesterol and heart disease. And I'm, I'm sure we'll get into this, but that's why so many amyloid trials have failed. I say it's like having a patient with congestive heart failure who needs a bypass, a coronary bypass, and the doc says, don't worry about it. Just take this Lipitor, just take some statin. And of course, that's not going to that will help for the future, but it's not going to make his heart better. That's what amyloid drugs are doing for Alzheimer's. And you got to use those as early as you use cholesterol drugs for heart disease. And the genetics teaches us this. And we geneticists get it. But man, trying to get the pharma companies to get that, that's a whole other story. 